Where are you from? Where are you from? They ask. Is your mom from here? Is your dad from there? They ask. I'm from here, from today, same as everyone else, I say. No, where are you really from? They insist. I ask Abuelo because he knows everything, and like me, he looks like he doesn't belong. Where am I from? Abuelo thinks, his eyes squint like he's looking inside his heart for an answer. You come from the Pampas, the open, free land, he says. You're from the Gaucho, brave and strong, from the brown river that cleanses and feeds the land that gives us the grain for our bread and the milk from the cows. You're from mountains so high they tickle Senor Cielo's belly, where the condor roots, roosts his family and the jaguar prowls the night. But you're also from the warm blue oceans the copper warriors tried to tame, and the elegant palm trees stretch their fingers to caress. You're from hurricanes and dark storms, and a tiny singing frog that calls the island people home when the sun goes to sleep. From this land where our ancestors built a home for all, even when they were in chains because of the color of their skin. You're from the grandmothers who search for their grandchildren, waiting, always waiting in a plaza, their white handkerchiefs wrapped, wrapping their sorrow of their thoughts. You come from the sunshine that lights our path in this world and the rain that washes away our mistakes. But Abuelo, I ask, where am I really from? Abuelo laughs. You want a place? He points to his heart. You're from here, from my love and the love of all those before us. From those who dreamed of you because of a song sung under the Southern Cross or the words in a book written under the light of the North Star. You, you are from all of us. I am. All right, that's it. Well, my name is Miss Webster, and I will be reading Fry Bread, a Native American family story, written by Kevin Noble Maylard and illustrated by Juana Martinez Neal. And it is a Caldecott Honor winner. Fry bread is food, flour, salt, water, cornmeal, baking powder, perhaps milk, maybe sugar, all mixed together in a big bowl. Fry bread is shape. Hands mold the dough, flat like a pancake, round like a ball, or puffy like Nana's softest pillow. Fry bread is sound. The skillet clangs on the stove. The fire blazes from below. Drop the dough in the skillet. The bubbles sizzle and pop. Fry bread is color. Golden brown, tan or yellow. Deep like coffee, sienna or earth. Light like snow and cream. Warm like rays of sun. Fry bread is flavor. See beans or soup. Smell tacos, cheese, and vegetables. Delight in honey and jam. Rise to discover what brings us together. Fry bread is time. On weekdays and holidays, supper or dinner, powwows and festivals, moments together with family and friends. Fry bread is art, sculpture, landscape, portrait, our daily craft, shared from teacher to student, a cycle of heritage and fortune. Fry bread is history, the long walk, 
the stolen land, strangers in our own world, with unknown food, we made new recipes from what we had. Fry bread is place, Alaska, Kansas, all the way to Maine, down to Delaware, on to Georgia, over to Oklahoma, Colorado, and California. Cities and lands we call home. Fry bread is nation. Abenaki, Apache, Arapaho, Ojibwe, Onondaga, Oglala Sioux, Narangaset, Navajo, Nipmuc, Seminole, Shoshone, Sac, and Fox. Hundreds and hundreds of tribes. Fry bread is everything. Round, flat, large, small, north, south, east, west. Brown, yellow, black, white. Familiar and foreign, old and new, we come together. Fry bread is us. We are still here, elder and young, friend and neighbor. We strengthen each other to learn, change, and survive. Fry bread is you. And here's our recipe for fry bread. That's the end. Lauren Waddell, fourth grade teacher here at Heritage. So we have Alma and how she got her name. Alma, Sophia, Esperanza, Jose, Pura, Candela had a long name. Too long, if you asked her. My name is so long, Daddy, it never fits, Alma said. Come here, he said. Let me tell you the story of your name then decide if it fits. Sophia was your grandmother, he began. She loved books, poetry, jasmine flowers, and of course, me. She was the one who taught me to read. I love books and flowers, and you too, Daddy. I am Sophia. Esperanza was your great-grandmother, he continued. She hoped to travel, but never left the city where she was born. Her only son grew up to cross the seven seas. Wherever her sailor son went, so did Esperanza's heart. The world is so big. I want to go see it, Daddy. You and me together. I am Esperanza. Jose was my father, Alma's daddy said. He was an artist with a big family like many people had back then. Early each morning he walked to the mountains and the plazas to paint everyday life. Sometimes I went along. Your grandfather taught me to see and love our people. I wake up early every day and I draw a lot too. This morning I drew a kitty cat for you, daddy. I am Jose. Pura was your great aunt. She believed that the spirits of our ancestors are always with us, watching over us. When you were born, she tied a red string around your wrist, a charm to keep you safe. Hello, Pura. It's me, Alma. Candela was your other grandmother. She always stood up for what was right. I am Candela. I love the story of my name. Now tell me about Alma, Daddy. Where does that come from? I picked the name Alma just for you. You are the first and the only Alma, and you will make your own story. Alma, Sophia, Esperanza, Jose, Pura, Candela. 
That's my name and it fits me just right. I am Alma and I have a story to tell. Hello, Heritage. We are going to be reading Let the Children March by Monica Clark Robinson, illustrated by Frank Morrison. Let the Children March. 1963, Birmingham, Alabama. I couldn't play on the same playground as the white kids. I couldn't go to their school. I couldn't drink from their water fountains. There were so many things I couldn't do. One warm spring night, my family went to church. We weren't there to have regular services. We were there to hear Dr. King speak. We were there to plan. He wanted to raise an army of peaceful protesters to fight for freedom. His brown eyes flashing fire and love. Dr. King told us the time had come to march. If I march, Mama said, I'll lose my job, sure enough. I can't march, Daddy said. I got a family to feed. The weight of the world rested on our parents' shoulders, but this burden, this time, did not have to be theirs to bear. I don't have a boss to fear, my brother said, or a job to lose. We can march this time. We'll be Dr. King's army, I said. I'll be fine, Daddy, I promise. Don't worry, Mama. Dr. King didn't like children being put in harm's way. He was a daddy too, after all. But he said that though we were young, we were not too young to want our freedom. Let the children march. They will lead the way. On May 2nd, a sunny Thursday, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, cousins and friends, we all met at the church, dressed in our best, feet ready. In a silence so loud that I could hear was my racing heart, we began to walk. Hand in hand we marched, so frightened, yet certain of what was right for freedom. The path may be long and troubled, but I'm gonna walk on. Would I be hurt? Would we be heard? Would it all be worth it in the end? I wanted to run from the angry faces in the crowd, run from the danger, run from the fear. Boys and girls, brothers and sisters, cousins and friends, on and on we marched, we marched, we marched, singing the songs of freedom, one thousand strong we came. Hate dog, my heels all that day. It's yellowed canine teeth sharp, but courage walked by my side and kept me going. Disperse or you'll be jailed, the police shouted the first day. Disperse or you'll get wet, the police shouted the second day. Disperse or we'll release the dogs, the police shouted the third day. We did not disperse. We kept on marching. We couldn't stop until things started to change. Hundreds of us went to jail on that first day and even more on the second. My turn wasn't until the third day. After I was sprayed by water stronger than anything I've ever felt, rough hands pushed me forward and I fell to my knees in the police wagon. I was going to jail. Dr. King reassured our parents. Don't worry about your children, he said. They're going to be all right. Don't hold them back if they want to go to jail, for they are doing a job for not only themselves, but for all of America and for all mankind. That night crowded into a cell too small for even half of the kids we sang. We shall overcome. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. And freedom is coming. Our parents couldn't be there with us, but still we sang, wrapped in the proud and loving arms of our ancestors. I 
I was still in jail, but we heard that the next day and the next more kids marched. The water hoses they used to sting us could not stop our fierce tide. The path may be long and troubled, but I'm going to walk on. Turn the other cheek, we had been taught. Show love where there is hate. The world watched as hate bruised us, but for seven days we walked only in love. The jails swelled to bursting, and even President Kennedy took notice. Daddy said the president received letters and calls about us from all over the world. Our march would become a memory, a small part of a larger story. But we have been heard, and the seeds of revolution were sown. Two, night, two days and nights I stayed in the jail. Some stayed even longer. When I left, I was tired and sore. My best dress was ripped, but my smile was as wide as the Mississippi River. I made a difference. I'm so proud of you, baby girl, Mama said. Your march was what made them see. With nothing more than our feet, voices, and courage, we had done what others could not. Change was right around the corner. We felt it like a cool breeze in an Alabama August. On May 10th, the great news rang out. Dr. King had reached an agreement with the white leaders of the city. Desegregation would begin. One month later, I was playing on the playground I'd never been allowed to play on before. Two months later, my family ate at a diner we'd never been allowed to eat in before. Our march made the difference. We children led the way, singing the songs of freedom. One thousand strong we came. The end. Hi Heritage, this is Mrs. Katie. I'm gonna be reading Rosie v Revere Engineer by Andrea Beattie and illustrated by David Roberts. This is the story of Rosie Revere who dreamed of becoming a great engineer. In Lila Greer's classroom at Blue River Creek, young Rosie sat shyly, not daring to speak. But when no one saw her, she peeked in the trash for treasures to add to her engineer's stash. And late, late at night, Rosie rolled up her sleeves and built in her hideaway under the eaves. Alone in her attic, the moon high above, dear Rosie made gadgets and gizmos she loved. And when she grew sleepy, she hid her machines far under the bed where they would never be seen. When Rosie was young, she had not been so shy. She worked with her hair swooping over one eye and made fine inventions for uncles and aunts, a hot dog dispenser, and helium pants. The uncle she loved most was zookeeper Fred. She made him a hat to keep snakes off his head from parts of a fan and some cheddar cheese spray, which everyone knows keeps the pythons away. And when it was finished, young Rosie was proud, but Fred slapped his knee and he chuckled out loud. He laughed till he wheezed and his eyes filled with tears, all to the horror of Rosie Revere, who stood there embarrassed, perplexed, and dismayed. She looked at the cheese hat and she then looked away. I love it, Fred hooted. Oh, truly I do. But Rosie knew that could not be true. She stuck the cheese hat on the back of her shelf and after that day kept her dreams to herself. And that's how it went until one autumn day, her oldest relation showed up for a stay. Her great-great-aunt Rose was a true dynamo who'd worked building airplanes a long time ago. She told Rosie tales of the things she had done and goals she had checked off her list one by one. She gave a sad smile as she looked to the sky. The only thrill left on my list is to fly, but time never lingers as long as it seems. I'll chalk that one up to an old lady's dreams.
That night, as Rosie lay wide-eyed in bed, a daring idea crept into her head. Could she build a gizmo to help her aunt fly? She looked at the cheese hat and said, no, not I. But questions are tricky and some hold on tight, and this one kept Rosie awake through the night. So when dawn approached and red streaks lit the sky, young Rosie knew just how to make her aunt fly. She worked and she worked till the day was half gone, then hauled her cheese copter out onto the lawn to give her invention a test just to see the ridiculous flop it might turn out to be. Strapped into the cockpit, she flipped on the switch. The hella cheese copter sputtered and twitched. It floated a moment and whirled round and round, then froze for a heartbeat and crashed to the ground. Then Rosie heard laughter and turned round to see the old woman laughing and slapping her knee. She laughed till she wheezed and her eyes filled with tears, all to the horror of Rosie Revere, who thought, oh no, never, not ever again, will I try to build something to sputter or spin, or build with a lever, a switch, or a gear, and never will I be a great engineer. She turned round to leave, but then great-great Aunt Rose grabbed hold of young Rosie and pulled her in close, and hugged her and kissed her and started to cry. You did it! Hooray! It's a perfect first try. This great flop is over. It's time for the next. Young Rosie was baffled, embarrassed, perplexed. I failed, said dear Rosie. It's just made of trash. Did you see it? The cheese copter crashed. Yes, said her great aunt. It crashed. That's true. But first it did just what it needed to do. Before it crashed, Rosie, before that, it flew. Your brilliant first flop was a raging success. Come on, let's get busy and on to the next. She handed a notebook to Rosie Revere, who smiled at her aunt as it all became clear. Life might have its failures, but this was not it. The only true failure can come if you quit. They worked till the sun sneaked away to its bed. Aunt Rose tied her headscarf around Rosie's head and sent her to sleep with a smile ear to ear to dream the bold dreams of a great engineer. At Blue River Creek, all the kids in grade two build gizmos and gadgets and doohickeys too. With each perfect failure, they all stand and cheer, but none quite as proudly as Rosie Revere. Rosie Revere Engineer. Today I will read the book Radiant Child by Ivaka Steptoe, the story of Jean-Michael Besquois, a young artist. Radiant Child. Somewhere in Brooklyn, between hearts that thump, double dutch and hopscotch, and salty mouths that slurp sweet ice, a little boy dreams of being a famous artist. In his house, you can tell a serious artist dwells. As he sits at a table with pencils scattered everywhere, Jean Michael draws from morning until night with a serious face amid a storm of papers. He refuses to sleep until he has created a masterpiece. At night, images enchant Jean Michael's mind, and he wakes from his dreams to add one more line. His drawings are not neat or clean, nor does he color inside the lines. They are sloppy, ugly, and sometimes weird, but still somehow beautiful. His art comes from his mother, Matilda, a Puerto Rican woman who designs and sews, cooks and cleans, and makes the house look like a stylish magazine. But most important, she lies on the floor and draws with Shawn Michael, on his father's old work papers. From her, he learns that art is not only in the poetry books she reads to him or in the theaters and museums they visit. Art is the street games of little children and our style and the words that we speak. 
It is how the messy patchwork of the city creates new meaning for ordinary things. While visiting the museum, they look at his favorite works of art. Reading the story behind each artist, reading the story behind each work, this is how Jean Michael learns what it means to be a famous artist. Back at home, he creates art on the floor as his father, Gerard, plays jazz records. Mama Matilda cooks arroz con palo and calls Jean Michael, mi amor. The energy and life of the city can be felt in each line of his drawings. As time goes by, Jean Michael learns that art has a healing power. After a car accident, he is scared and confused. Matilda gives him a book to calm his fears. It is filled with pictures of bones, skulls, and other body parts. Jean Michael draws from it until he knows it all by heart. He is no longer afraid. Back at home, Jean Michael's body heals, but his heart breaks. His mother's mind is not well, and the family breaks. She no longer lies on the floor and draws with Jean Michael, but sits by the window singing only to birds. Jean Michael is confused and filled with a terrible blues when Matilda can no longer live at home. He tries drawing, but the terrible he tries drawing the terrible out of his blues, but things are not the same. As Jean Michael grows older, he visits his mother when he can, always bringing his artwork to show, telling her that one day it will be in a museum, when I am a famous artist. A teenager now, Jean Michael decides, Papa, I will be very, very famous one day. With a sly look, a twinkle in his eye, Jean Michael leaves Brooklyn for New York City, the Lower East Side, a concrete jungle where only the tough survive. During the day, dressed in a green jumpsuit splattered with paint, Jean Michael stays with friends, sleeping on couches and floors, leaving a barrage of collages and poem filled papers everywhere he goes. At night, Jean Michael spray paints the walls downtown with poems and drawings that catch the eye of artists, gallery goers, and passers by. Under his art, he signs the name Samu instead of Jean Michael. Everybody wants to know who is Samu? Samu moves from street corners to art gallery walls with powerful color composition and line, collaging and painting on anything he can find. His art is still not neat or clean and definitely not inside the lines, but somehow still beautiful. With his magical charm, Jean Michael draws a crowd, but when it's time to work, he prefers to be alone with the radio and TV on full blast. Now in expensive suits splattered with paint, he flips through stacks of magazines and open books and paints into the night and sometimes for days at a time, while sounds and images jump into his head. Jean Michael, an artist among artists, never doubts one line creating from a soundtrack that is all his own. People describe him as radiant, wild, a genius child, but in his heart he is king, so he draws crowns for himself and others he admires. A grown man now, with the art world in his hands, Jean Michael still visits his mother when he can. And at his most important shows, above all the critics, fans, and artists he admires, the place of honor is his mother's, a queen on a throne. He is now a famous artist. And that's the end.